Good afternoon and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. I have joining me today the manager of HLS through the Dynetics Corporation. Her name is Kathy Lorini, and this is the second time that she has granted me an interview, and actually the first interview that she has granted since an award was made under Appendix N for the human landing system for our return to the moon. So greatly appreciate that. I am both grateful and humbled by that and uh, looking forward to speaking with you. Um, Ms. Lorini, by the way, is a veteran of NASA with over 35 years of experience and a graduate of Notre Dame University. Doing all right today? All right. Well, thank you very much for that uh, clarification. Lost you uh, just briefly there um, on your uh, speaker or something along those lines. So uh, in any event, I'll, I'll try to keep that a little clearer. Um, the first question, I guess, that I have, this has all been sort of a convoluted thing, and a lot of folks have not fully understood what's been going on, and that uh, appeal was turned down. And Blue Origin has now gone further and gone to the federal court system. However, you have not. Instead, you've just pressed forward with Appendix N. Can you tell us how Appendix N differs from the award that was recently made? Yes. So the, um, the award that was recently made to SpaceX under the next step BAA uh, Appendix H, actually, is um, one targeting a landing at the, on the lunar, pole, lunar South Pole in 2024, right? So um, it reflected a policy decision by the previous administration to ask NASA to accelerate their timeline for getting people back to the surface of the moon. So NASA's response to that was this Appendix H. And in order to make the 2024 launch date, they had to um, remove some critical requirements from the lander, things that they wanted historically. And, you know, you mentioned I was working with NASA, and one of my jobs while I was at NASA was helping to formulate the lunar plan. And, and NASA's original plan before the 2024 date came about was to put people on the surface of the moon in 2028, but to put four people down and, and be able to do more things on the surface of the moon. So what, um, what Appendix N does is reflect that new reality. You know, the, the SpaceX was selected for a couple of reasons. I mean, they put in a good proposal and a good price. Um, and NASA understandably would like to get people on the moon as soon as they can, um, but they it, they really want this so-called sustainable lander, this four-person lander that, that enables them to do a lot more on the surface of the moon. So um, Appendix N was created for that purpose. Um, so we didn't protest, or we didn't um, uh, decide to follow up once the GAO um, denied our protest. We decided to just accept the accept the situation and move forward and focus our efforts on this four-person sustainable lander that NASA um, is seeking to advance under Appendix N. So, what um, what the awards announced this week do is is allow them to have five companies um, in working with NASA to fully understand the requirements of this so-called sustainable lander and reduce some of the risks associated with their solution and um, advance their design concept as much as possible with the limited amount of funding that comes with Appendix N. So these final words are sort of like, and, and, and Appendix N is sort of like a bridge contract to the NASA uh, main solicitation, um, which is going to be a lunar exploration transportation services contract. So it's kind of confusing, but they're hoping, you know, they said when they picked SpaceX that they were still committed to competition, 
and appendix N is a reflection that they still are. So they are um, funding five teams to further advance their design of this sustainable lander in, in, um, in hopes of establishing a competitive environment for actually the lunar transportation services. So um, we're super excited to get an award and um, we're getting the team back together to um, to refine our design. So we were able to do a bit since we lost um, the, uh, the, the competition um, to SpaceX, we were able to continue to work our advance our design to address some of the weaknesses we had and, and prepare for anticipated um, new requirements for NASA. So we've been, we've been working at, at a low level um, for the last months, but we're super excited about this opportunity to um, uh, raise it up a notch, let's say. So um, tell me something. It, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, another question uh, in regards to Appendix N, Blue Origin has publicly stated, they say so on their website actually as kind of part of a media campaign, that Appendix N is not going to work for competition, that the, uh, the original winner um, under pre Appendix H, and thank you for correcting me on that, we go, th even I'm confused by this contract sometimes, um, the, uh, that, that, you know, the, the folks who receive the award, the company that receives that award is going to have such a massive head start that whoever's competing under Appendix N just simply won't be able to compete. Um, how do you react to that? Correct that you know SpaceX will have a massive head start, but um, you know this is a sustainable lunar program. So you know SpaceX may have um, uh, and NASA let me say and NASA you know knows that for the program to be sustainable, they need two providers. They can't rely on one. They can't rely on um, only SpaceX. So just like um, for for commercial crew delivery services to the space station, they have two providers. Um, SpaceX is flying, Boeing will be soon. Commercial cargo delivery to the space station, they have three providers. And, and that's because long term, they want the competition that keeps the prices down and drives innovation up. So they want the same thing for, for the lunar surface exploration um, activity. And, and they, that means they're going to need two providers. So yes, one will have a massive advantage and be ready sooner. Um, but, um, you know, if you think long term, you know, you need to keep pressure uh, on uh, um, the pressure to keep costs down and, um, and um, drive innovation. And so that's why they're committed to two. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the appendix N cores are super small and are basically, you know, consistent with the money NASA has in the near term. So their plans are to... Um, and you hear um, Senator Nelson, the NASA administrator, talking very actively with, with, with Congress and the administration about how to do that. But their plans are to, to get some more money so that this lunar exploration transportation services contract, which will, you know, they will pick um, competitors for that probably, you know, within a year's time, um, those, they'll have more money. So uh, whoever wins that let's contract, if you will, will have a, a robust enough budget to get another lander developed, you know, not by 2024, surely, but, you know, by, I think NASA's timeline is 2028 now. Um, so, you know, it, it, at, at some point they'll have two. Well, that sounds good. Uh, competition is definitely something that served us very well since it was introduced uh, about a decade ago. And uh, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you there. Um, you mentioned the strengths and weaknesses of proposals. A lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the mass issue with the alpaca. Um, can you A, explain what that issue was, um, just to in, you know, let us know what, what, uh, what problem existed, and also B, has that problem been solved and how? Um, so I, I, I would say the math issue will be, it is our number one issue to continue working, right? We, um, when NASA commented on our proposal 
for the Appendix H, Option A, um, and they noted the weakness of math. They were right. You know, we had, um, by the time we had to submit our proposal, we were carrying a significant math challenge. And I would say, you know, the reason for that is multifold. But, you know, if you're, if you're trying to be ready in 2024, um, you look for hardware that's available and, um, and you know, engines that you can realistically realize. You know, you look for things that enable you to, to meet a timeline, but they end up driving, they end up being heavy. So we, we had some heavy, heavy subsystems. We also, um, you know, when you have a single stage lander, you are um, not leave and not leaving anything on the surface. You know, we we um, uh, we firmly believe that our solution to not you know leaving a bunch of things behind at Artemis Base Camp makes the most sense. And you know, being able to put things down on the surface, close to the surface, makes a lot of sense. But that means we are carrying stuff down and back up, which makes math even more critical. So. Um, I would say that after the um, um, after our PDR at the beginning of this year, um, when we reviewed the design that w resulted in NASA's um, concerns about our math, we, we started a dedicated effort to try to understand where we could um, reduce math and also what we could do with mission design to, to close, if you will, with adequate margin. So we came up with a, with a solution that um, does close with adequate margin, which is the good news. That said, it's still um, it's still heavy, and it still needs a lot of propellant in lunar space to um, to accomplish the mission. So, you know, I think that what NASA is telling us with the um, with the award here for Appendix N is, I mean, hey, we really like your solution. You know, you you've got a great way of putting cargo down. You've got a great you know crew crew centric design, but you know, you gotta continue to find ways to get the math down. And, and we have a bunch more tricks up our sleeve that we'll be working hard in the coming months to try to do that. Um, and um, and hopefully we'll be successful. I think, you know, NASA has taken us taken us with this award. Um, we just need to, to deliver it. And if we if we can't get the math down we will um, you know, we likely won't be as competitive uh, cost wise as other offers. So we're motivated. I see. So, um, and you, you mentioned not leaving anything behind. Uh, am I to take that to mean that the drop tanks are no longer part of your design, leaving drop tanks, or is that still there? We have gotten away from the drop tanks, um, which may be, um, Maybe it was a good decision, maybe not. But, um, you know, in, when we look at 2024 and the, um, uh, the, the development risk associated with the interface between the drop tanks, so, you, know, that, you know, we had to make a remotely controlled interface that, that had power and data and, and, um, and propellant interfaces. Um, uh, and it was, it was, you know, we were intimidated by the technology maturation glide slope, and so we got away from those. Um, you know, we are again looking at whether or not we should, um, we should, you know, go back to an architecture like that. But um, um, that was part of the reason why we created a, a mass issue for ourselves. I see. So that that could be a big part. Well, it sounds like that would be a big part of it. If you have to essentially haul up everything and you're not even disposing of the drop tanks, that in itself, it seems to me, would create a bit of a mass issue. Um, so, But at the same time, that also means 100% reusability. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we are um, big believers in the um, the benefits of having a, a, a depot around the moon, and we've been working with some partners to try to, um, you know, understand how that might be realized. But you know, if there, you know, and, and you heard Tori Bruno from ULA talking about the um, strategic importance of a propellant reserve around the moon, and and there are more as more people and, and uh, capabilities exist around the moon to serve NASA and other customers. Um, you know, both, both 
private sector and, and um, U.S. government and international security customers, perhaps. You know, the, the, the idea of a propellant depot around the moon is very interesting. So if we can um, realize that propellant depot, and, and we're not talking about a depot that's customized just for us, but we're talking about you know, everybody needs oxygen, right? So so why not, um, why not build a depot built that can serve... Um, multiple customers, and so um, if we can do that, all we have to do is, is pull up and, and fill our tanks, and that makes that simplifies a lot the, the 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 operational concept, the operational scenario. It takes a lot of risk out of that operational scenario, and um, and 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 has the ability to significantly lower the cost and complexity of our missions. You know, so you could create an ecosystem where um, you know the operator and the depot will pay the lowest bidder for delivering crop to the depot, which they would sell to customers like us. So that's sort of the, the you know, the long-term vision that many people have, and, and we're certainly supportive of it and actively working. I mean, we'd even, you know, stand up and raise our hand and say, yes, we'll be an anchor tenant if you make it happen. Um, so um, that's uh, uh, something that is enabled without these drop tanks. Interesting. Um, well, yeah, it's it, it definitely a fuel depot around the moon is something that I've advocated pretty much since I started this channel. So definitely a solution that would work out. So so tell me, um, you know, in, in an ideal world, uh, in your mind's eye, visualize this lander as you would like it to be. How would a mission look, a repeating mission? Let's say you have to make two visits to the moon using the same lander. What would be the process involved with doing that? Um, okay, so our, our lander, one of the tenets of our design is to make it reusable from the start, you know, completely reusable from the start, just needing to refuel and, you know, some... Um, um, consumables to support the crew. Um, and so, uh, and we're, we're committed to that. So the vision would be, you know, the first mission, you know, you tank up into this winter space and you and you take the crew, you pick up the crew at the gateway and then you take them down to the surface, you bring them back up to the gateway and then you go later into lunar space and um, wait for the next mission. And so the next mission, you do, all you need is the fuel and the, and the crew consumables. You can get the crew consumables at the gateway, so that's an easy problem to solve. But, but the, the fuel, um, you would need to deliver it either through, the, through tankers or getting it at a depot. So we would, we would fill up, and then um, the same system that took the crew to the surface would pick up the crew again at the gateway and, and take them back down to the surface. So we think that, you know, multiple missions with, with one system um, allows us to, to get close to competing with, you know, billionaire-funded teams. Um, you know, it, it, it enables, it gets closer to us offering um, a, a value to NASA that is, um, that is uh, you know, includes cost benefits um, as well as mission risk benefits. So, so that's our that's our goal. So, and then we have a cargo variant of the lander. The cargo variant of the lander could could launch with say NASA's pressurized rover, um, and then and then it could wait around, take it to the surface, and then go back up. And it could wait around uh, in this sort of space. And when NASA is ready to bring the um, foundational surface hub. Uh, to the surface, they can they can deliver it on an SLS Block One B right to the gateway, and we can just go pick it up at the gateway and take it down to the surface with the same lander that already took the rover down. So, so you know that's the that's the vision for reusability with both the crew version and the cargo version. I don't think you'd ever see a crew version where you leave the crew module somewhere and then use it in between as a cargo variant, but um, but the platform, you know, the alpaca. It's basically the same. I mean, all you have to do is make a, you know, if we have a plan for making the arch a little bit bigger to carry the hab and the rover that NASA launched. Um, but, you know, the, the other systems uh, are, are the same. Now, in terms of the uh, the module and in terms of some potential changes, uh, I have noticed a, an illustration that came out at Sierra Nevada depicting the alpaca with an inflatable module, kind of like their life habitation module. Are you folks exploring that kind of thing, that kind of solution of using a, an inflatable module uh, in to perhaps reduce mass and other advantages that that offers? We are not. Um, talking to Sierra Nevada, we have inflatables for the crew module. You know, inflatables really make 
makes sense when you, you know, you need a net habitable volume to be uh, a lot greater. Um, so that is longer duration surface days, right? So, so we think that the lander ought to be a transportation system. It ought to, it ought to be a reliable and safe capability that can take the crew from the gateway to the surface of the moon and back reliably and safely and not, you know, a, a place where the crew spends a lot of, a lot of time, you know, let them spend time on the surface assets. So what Sierra Nevada, Sierra Space now, by the way, is showing is, you know, part of their concept for a, um, uh, this foundational surface habitat that NASA wants. And they've been working with NASA through another Next step, VAA appendix, I forget which one it is, maybe it's even A, the first one. But anyway, they've been working, as, as have a number of other companies, with NASA on, ha on surface habitat concepts. And, um, and the CR Space guys have a pretty interesting um, concept that it does involve uh, an inflatable component. And, and since they're part of our team, they're a key teammate, teammate with us, um, you know, it's pretty great that they show our land or taking it to the surface. But that's, that's the origin of that image. Gotcha. So it's a uh, it's a depiction of alpaca bringing an inflatable module to the surface to be subsequently used as a surface habitat. Correct. Correct. Right. That's that's a very interesting idea. Um, I like it. Okay. Um, another question, and and you may not be able to answer or even speculate on this. However. Everybody has found it to be very interesting that uh, that the members of the national team, Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman, have now received separate awards. They have been questioned about this, and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman have stated that they remain committed to the national team, but at the same time that they are looking at other options or pursuing other options do the do their proposals i don't know if you even know anything about their proposals but it does it seem to suggest that these companies are kind of going their own way on appendix n um you know i don't know enough of the details but i can i can speculate that they are um, you know companies like lockheed and northrop grumman have a long history in in building, you know, space, significant space capabilities for NASA. And so, you know, as you see the challenge NASA has in, in getting funding and all the things NASA wants to do, you know, maybe there's better ideas that people have and, and they decide to just throw it into the ring and, and let, let NASA decide, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I that's the way I read it, but again, I'm not, you know, we're focused on our solution and, making the best of it um, rather than trying to, um, you know, guess about the com competition. I understand that that does make uh, perfect sense to me. Now, another question that, that folks are asking a lot right now or what seems to be very confusing to them is the the initial um, scores that uh, have been awarded to these proposals, um, you know, both Blue Origin and SpaceX seem to have better scores um, on their proposals than Dynetics does, but the award to made to Dynetics was uh, significantly in excess of what was made to Blue Origin and SpaceX combined. So that would seem very inconsistent to the, uh, the average observer. Can you comment on that at all? Uh, I, mean, I would say that... Um you know, NASA evaluates proposals for, you know, with a lot of criteria, making sure that you address exactly what they want to see in, in, in the proposal, and um, and everybody does their best. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the technical, and we did, so we did our best, right? The, the technical weakness, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, math is still a challenge, and we've got... Um, uh, we've got a lot of technology projects that will help increase performance and uh, enable us to to to, um, to to solve to to help you know contribute to solving those problems. So I think that um, what, what what I would take away from NASA's award is you know they they see a lot of merit in our concept, right? I mean nobody else can put these big cargo items down on the surface. So easily, and, and and they don't have that many big cargo items, so it makes sense to try to combine that with a crew crew lander. 
So I think they 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 would really like to see uh, us us be successful and 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 they uh, and, and we did focus a lot on you know defining the the, the technology demonstrations and and the tech, specific technology projects that are included in the so-called Swim Two. Um, and, and, and NASA saw a lot of merit in, in those and saw how we connected those to, to being able to deliver them, uh, you know, a cost-effective um, value-delivering lander system. So, um, yes, you know, we noted the same things. We haven't had our full debriefing with NASA yet, so I don't know anything. We don't, I don't know any more than what's been written in the, in the statement, but, but um, you know, we... we um, you know, like everybody, we got, we've got work to do and, and technologies to mature. And um, and NASA's award, we think, uh, continues to um, demonstrate that they would like to see us be successful um, and, and see a path to us being successful. So we're going to do everything that we can to give them the best possible option from a performance and a cost standpoint. Well, it's, uh, that's encouraging, definitely. Um, and yeah, that, that does make sense to me. So it sounds like what you're saying is, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, that NASA sees the value in the concept. They very much believe in the concept, but until that mass issue is resolved, it sounds like that's the major thing. Until that you have a you know 100% solution for that, the technical rating is not going to be that high until it's resolved. But at the same time, if they're going to invest more money in you than in any of the other competitors, it sounds like they at least have some confidence that you're going to be able to do that. I, I would agree, you know, and, and again, until we get a full debrief from NASA, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just speculating on, on the rationale for it, but, um, but I agree. Well, great. Um, another question. This is from uh, one of my supporters. Um, in re- given what happened with the uh, previous uh, proposal, are you guys? How are you going to f- focus more on price? Because obviously, price is a big deal, and billionaires can throw tons of their own money at a project, and you guys can't. So, do you have any plans on how to bring down cost? Yes, we do. Um, and you know, I think reducing mass also reduces cost. But um, we're never going to be, you know, in the in the billionaire funded. You know, we're never going to be able to compete with it with somebody that, that's funded by a billionaire who's willing to put a lot of money in, right? So. Um, yes, we, we do a strategy and we will be working with cost very hard and we have we have since, you know, in the last several months. Um, I, I would say though that part of our strategy is to demonstrate the value of our system, right? So let's say our uh, uh, if you pick a landing system only based on cost, um, you might miss the opportunity to um, deliver uh, your, a big habitat to the surface without the use of a crane that you would need to, you know, launch on another large cargo lander just to get it down there, right? So so you can imagine that, um, you know, helping NASA understand that it's not just about cost, but it's about value um, is, is going to be a priority for us. Um, I think, you know, also, you know, those of you that are quick, close to your viewers that are, I know there's a lot of people that are following you that are big SpaceX fans, SpaceX fans and I'm also really impressed by everything that they've done. But if you look at the, we've got a corner on the market for delivering crew and, and, um, and, and, you know, they've got a big contract for cargo to the space station. And, you know, the prices that they offered NASA initially are a lot lower than the prices they're charging now, right? So you, don't want to be in the hands of, of of somebody that may be trying to recruit their investment, or somebody that may, you know, be uh, um, uh, you know interested in doing something else, like going to Mars, for example. You know, what is what kind of price would Elon charge if if he could only launch X number of starships a year and he needed you know X minus you know Y for launching the Starlink satellites, and he's only got the capacity to either sell them to NASA or going go to Mars, I'm speculating, right? But what, I, what my message is, you, know, you, you, you protect your 
yourself, you get value by protecting yourself against um, certain scenarios that you probably should protect yourself with if you have all your eggs in the billionaire basket. So, so I think our, our strategy would be to do everything we can to reduce costs, and we, we, we need to do that, um, but also to show that there is unique value that's provided by our solution, and that should be worth something, too. Well, I think there's also a matter of long-term expense, something that I've often argued. If, we're, if, you're, if you're going up against, say, the national team solution, which is two-thirds expendable, requiring a new transfer element and a new lander every time you go to the moon, there's a lot of recurring expenses, you know, as time goes on, as opposed to a 100% reusable solution. So I would say, I mean, would you say it's a fair statement that for long-term expenses, um, the Alpac is going to be a better solution? I think so, yes. I think so. I think that's fair. You know, I know um, other teams have um, have reusability as goals, and, and um, you know, our reusability may be an advantage even in the near term. Gotcha. Well, um, let's see. I want to make sure that I've got just about everything covered. The questions from uh, from individuals in the field seem to have been fully covered. So just to quickly review what we've, uh, you, the mass issue, it sounds like you have pathways to to dealing with it, if you know, maybe getting the drop tanks back or some other solution, perhaps 3D printed engines. Do you see that being a, a possible solution to, to deal with it as well? Much lighter engines that a lot of folks are coming out with now. Yeah, well, there is, there is some interesting advancements in 3D printed engines. Um, so I, I can't speak specifically to that. You know, these. I don't know if engines of our size or, you know, whether they're going to be 3D printed, but I know people that are actively working on that. So I think um, it's something we will definitely watch, you know, if we can, anything that um, that provides, you know, I, we'll definitely watch it, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not the propulsion person, right, so I'm not um, able to give you a definitive answer that says, you know, we've got all these folks on our radar screen that we're going to evaluate, but... Um, we'll be using the time during the, the, the beginning of appendix and to, um, to, you know, address issues like, you know, propulsion system architecture and what we can do different to, to lower mass there, everywhere, everywhere. Well, I really appreciate the time that you gave me today, Kathy. It means a tremendous amount to me. I mean, when I get a chance, I, I look at these things from the outside and I do my best to, uh, to try to give my own editorial view on these things. I'm a huge believer in reusability. Um, your solution now being 100% reusable is, is a huge plus as far as I'm concerned. And the logistical simplicity you know, going down, coming back to cislunar space and refueling at a fuel depot. Um, all of that makes this into quite a solution. So I wish you folks the very best of luck. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share with your viewers the, the work that we're doing and, that we're, and, and our excitement at being part of this appendix and activity in, in helping NASA get people back to the moon. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, and you have a wonderful day. Thank you as well. So it would appear that competition and innovation is still very much alive in the HLS program with NASA and in our endeavors to return to the moon. And this is something I have always approved of, especially when we're talking about reusability. So until this process is finally finished and we're watching human beings take their first steps on the moon for more than half a century, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.